the situation on the ground is devastating and horrible right now. Out of the uh, once 37 functioning hospitals across Gaza, only three have surgical capacity. There's not only Hamas in Gaza, but there's actually people. Hello and welcome to Reactive's Beyond the Byline podcast. I am Evi Kiori, and this week we're looking at the dire situation in Gaza's hospitals. Hospitals in Gaza have found themselves on the front lines of the war. Hospitals have become a refuge for the growing number of civilians fleeing the violence, but they've also been a target. Israeli troops entered Gaza's biggest hospital on Wednesday, November 15th, and were searching its rooms and basement, according to reports, culminating in this way a days-long siege that caused global alarm over the fate of thousands of civilians trapped inside. Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City has become the main target of the ground operation by Israeli forces, who say Hamas fighters located the beating heart of their operations in tunnels beneath the hospital, information that Hamas denies. The UN stance is clear. Hospitals are in battlegrounds, and the situation in all Gaza's hospitals is dreadful since there is no electricity, no fuel, no water, no access to medication, equipment and food, with doctors from the ground pleading for help, resources and a ceasefire. The dire situation in Gaza unfolds with only 15 of the once 37 hospitals operating, with now merely three of them equipped for surgery. Patients' lives are in danger, with war-injured people and premature babies in incubators facing the highest risks. The situation on the ground is, is uh, devastating and horrible right now. Out of the uh, once 37 functioning hospitals across um, Gaza, only about 15 are partially functioning now. And most of them are in the south, and only three have surgical capacity. Christian Lindmeyer is spokesperson at the World Health Organization. So that means that many crucial interventions um, cannot happen anymore. And the one part is, of course, for the immediate war-related injuries, so crush injuries, amputations, wounds, shrapnels, um, crush wounds from buildings collapsing, and so on and so forth. That needs highly technicized uh, equipment that needs equipment for, for amputations, for surgeries, dressing wounds that needs blood. All that is not available right now in in large scale, maybe some leftover supplies somewhere. But you also have regular diseases, uh, long-standing diseases people had before. You have, for example, alone in Al-Shifa, we had 45 patients that were unable to receive their kidney dialysis. And people who need kidney dialysis and they cannot access the machines because of lack of fuel, lack of power, lack of uh, electricity, they will die and within a short amount of time. We had 37 premature babies that uh, needed to be in incubators, um, and uh, three have died to our information so far. Uh, The rest is, as we hear, still alive and is barely kept alive, but there needs to be a solution for this. So all these things that happen, women are still giving birth. Let's not forget that. This is highly important. 180 women a day in Gaza are giving birth. They cannot do so under any safe circumstances. There is no... Uh, there's no system in place anymore when there's any complication, when there's a C-section needed or just uh, postpartum hemorrhaging. None of this can be treated anymore in a sustainable way. Uh, so again, horrible conditions, way beyond just the horror of a war and the shooting and the and, and, and explosions. So the impact on the population is huge. In Gaza, the WHO's role differs from NGOs and the Red Cross They coordinate, gather data, and communicate with ministries of health. The WHO and the Ministry of Health have reported so far around 11,500 casualties, but the number of people killed in Gaza is estimated to be much higher. We do have uh, staff on the ground, uh, a few national uh, staff uh, who are mainly working as WHO staff on the administrative level, close cooperation with ministries of health. That's what we do in all countries across the world. 
um, whether there's a conflict or not, that our, our country officers or staff are in touch with the ministries rather than working directly on the ground. So you will not see WHO staff treating uh, patients, but you will like be like like other NGOs do or like the Red Cross does, for example. Um, but you will see us uh, mainly in response uh, or responsible for the coordination to uh, to gather data and everything uh, in, in on the level of the ministry. Now these these staff are in touch with the healthcare workers on the ground, with the people in the hospitals, but also of course with the ministries, with the uh, the lead of the the various hospitals, and this way getting their data, the official data from the ministries in order to to get the picture to see where response measures are needed get the requests if there's a logistical need if there's a supply need that's the general thing now in gaza specific of course this is highly jeopardized uh, since 11 november for example the uh, the system has collapsed of of uh, services and communications at the hospitals uh, so the data have not been updated anymore because uh, deaths, for example, are uh, only counted either in hospitals or in morgues uh, and then accumulated. So if you have a death occurring somewhere outside uh, a body under a rubble which hasn't been uh, detected yet or pulled out, that is not registered. Uh, that means the official figures are very likely lower than um, than where they are in real time. And the names of every victim normally get also registered. So the Ministry of Health has actually put out a list, a complete list of the names and ID numbers of every single victim they have uh, registered so far. And on 11 November, uh, the count was about 11,500. Uh, so, but again, we can safely assume that this is way higher, unfortunately. The WHO points a notable pattern emerging. 70% of the victims from both the Hamas attack in Israel and the attack of Israel in Gaza are women and children. This underscores the disproportionate toll on vulnerable groups, highlighting the fact that the innocent are the ones to carry the toll. 70%, and that's important, 70% were women and children. Um, that is, uh, interestingly, across uh, many conflicts, the same proportionality, by the way, is with the 1,200 victims in Israel who were killed in the first horrific attacks. Also there, 70% are women and children. So the ones paying the price are the women and the children. The ongoing war profoundly affects basic necessities, notably fresh water scarcity, as nearly 90% is salinated and requires electricity for desalination, which is currently unavailable. It's a lack of fresh water. There's no fresh water because the most of the water, nearly 95%, is salinated water with influx from the sea. So, uh, that needs to be pumped up, that needs to be salinated. Again, that needs electricity, which is not available. Waste needs to be traced, not only the human waste, but also the medical waste. All this cannot be safely discarded anymore. Uh, that means it's lying in the open with the, with the starting rains, apparently, in Gaza now, as we have been reported. That means everything is mixed now and the, the risk of infectious diseases, of lung diseases, anything is highly increasing. Despite UN and international efforts, Gaza's healthcare system struggles. Pre-conflict 600 daily truck deliveries sustained Gaza. Now only around 1,000 trucks in six weeks have entered the besieged territory. The lives of 2.4 million people in Gaza are on the line. So the one thing is what the UN and the international organizations and many other partners can do is ha have the supplies ready and be ready to supply whenever possible. And that system has been set up. Egypt has been extremely helpful in El Arish. Uh, El Arish, they have uh, opened a, a, a triage hospital, a first referral hospital where patients can be brought to. The Egyptian Red Crescent is ready for the transport on the Egyptian side to bring them to this hospital, to bring any patients to that hospital and transport them further. That's for medical evacuations. Similar for bringing material in. There's a huge supply line set up outside uh, from, an air, from an airfield uh, to the border of Rafa. There's hundreds and hundreds of trucks lining up. But maybe for a comparison, before the war, Gaza was already heavily depending on supply uh, from outside. All types of supplies from uh, food, um, also fresh water, medical supplies, but also other regular supplies for construction, for, uh, for clothing, what have you. So again, up to 600 trucks a day 
were necessary uh, already before the war. Now, in that time uh, we have now, which is about six weeks, uh, around 1,000 trucks have made it into Gaza now. So instead of 600 a day, we have now barely 1,000 in six weeks. So you can see in the magnitude that this is not enough. And on top of it, the needs of the population have completely changed and have amplified because of all the injuries, the wounds, the lacking medical supplies. So the demand is huge. The supply line would be there until Gaza, but from there on, it's the biggest challenge. It needs the agreement of all worrying parties. That's Israel, of course, but also uh, Hamas to grant safe access, grave safe access, tra grant transport all the way, not only across the border, but all the way to the various hospitals. Gaza had a functioning healthcare system um, that 37 hospitals plus many health, other health facilities were well taking care of the patients with all the limits they had in Gaza, but it was functioning. So they could be resupplied and even refurbished in some kinds of electricity needs to burn, but a lot needs to be brought on first and foremost for all these equipments, fuel. Now fuel is a challenge because fuel is considered dual use by Israel as it could of course be abused uh, as powering military installations, military facilities, rockets, what have you. So it's understandable that Israel is very worried about bringing fuel in. At the same time, this is exactly what is needed immensely all around Gaza. The desalination plants, the water pumps need fuel. The bakeries need fuel. The uh, dialysis uh, apparatus need fuel. The incubators need fuel. A surgical equipment needs fuel. The lights to operate somebody under light needs fuel, uh, needs, needs fuel and electricity. So everything is depending on it. And to bring this in on a massive scale is a huge challenge. Um, individual airdrops were done, but that, I mean, of course, this is a little help on a short moment, but it needs to be sustainable. If it's long term, it needs to be safe. Also, setting up emergency hospitals inside Gaza is theoretically possible, but you still need to supply them afterwards. And that means the same logistical chain needs to be uh, open, needs to be controlled, needs to be checked and verified by, by the Israelis uh, to be cleared. So it doesn't change the logistical problem. Similar with hospital ships outside, they can take care of some patients, but that's just the medical supply. Bringing in of supplies for 2.4 million people, that is the biggest challenge right now. Israel has given the notice to evacuate hospitals, but the biggest question is where are the injured people and patients supposed to be going? Evacuating critical patients in Gaza faces immense challenges due to logistical hurdles and constant shelling, preventing meticulous planning. Evacuation is possible from a theoretical point of view. You have also in, in Western countries or any country in the world, you sometimes need to refurbish a hospital and, and the hospitals need to relocate or patients need to be transferred. Um, but that needs weeks and months of planning. This needs careful planning. Those with critical injuries or critical diseases need to be in constant supply with electricity or with their with the with the apparatus they're on. It needs medical staff to accompany them. It needs special equipment like ambulances, special ambulance sometimes to transfer them. So a huge logistical effort. That is all possible but very, very impossible under the current circumstances where there's constant shelling, where there's maybe uh, a few hours of, of stop on a certain, of firing stop and bombing stop on a certain road, um, which cannot be organized in that short amount of time. On top of it, the biggest challenge, as you mentioned, is where to. Getting them out from one place is one thing, but you cannot just drop them outside the door afterwards. You need to bring them somewhere. And as we said before, less than half of the hospitals are functioning still and only three with surgical capacity the main functioning the main central hospital for gaza was the al shifa complex so uh, you don't have similar capacity in gaza anymore the hospitals in the south are overcrowded already so add another uh, batch there no it's not it's simply not feasible not possible uh, and that leaves the option, what then? Bring them outside of Gaza? Well, that would mean a mass exodus, which needs to be facilitated, which also needs to be agreed on. And the question is, 
are these people then allowed to return afterwards? Of course, that would be the main central question for them. So if you put all these questions in line, and many of them are political questions, um, you, you come only to one conclusion. It, under the current circumstances, the military and political reality, it's simply not possible. Gaza's a surveillance system is disrupted, making monitoring nearly impossible for WHO. Monthly lung infections surged from 2,000 to approximately 35,000 in the past four to five weeks. The absence of the functioning response system and the shortages in medical supplies pose a substantial risk, turning simple infections into severe health threats. There's a surveillance system in Gaza and WHO, that is actually one of the functions of WHO, working with the ministry and the hospitals to set up a functioning surveillance system. And there is, or there was. That means you, you monitor where a, where a certain uh, case of infection occurs, you monitor the immediate environment, the family, you trace maybe the neighborhood to see if this is a wider issue or not. All this is not possible anymore. With people cramped together, over 700,000 apparently, in UNRWA schools, as they report, people on the run, people on the move, with injuries, uh, with infections cramped in small, tight places, with additional risk of infection through the unsafe water and sanitation situation, um, there is hardly any control. We had about 2,000 um, uh, infections, lung infections, respiratory infections before the war, a month in Gaza. Now, uh, the latest figure we had is already four or five days ago. It's about 35,000 we have so far in this in these uh, four or five weeks until then. Uh, and that can only mount now an increase with uh, the ongoing dire situation with the personal situation and the, 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 the weather situation with the rains and the, and the mud and everything. Um, so normally there's a system to respond, plus the hospital or health facility uh, is the medical supplies, the simple medicines. I mean, for a normal small infection, you don't need much. You need maybe antibiotics. If that's not available, then a small infection becomes can become a huge risk. The impact on innocent people is what needs to be emphasized, according to Christian Lindmeier, not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, where the situation is also tense. The call for a ceasefire remains a crucial demand to prioritize civilian lives during the war. I think the UN, uh, or the whole UN international organizations and the international community, uh, including member states, have been very active. And what we are doing right now is, is part of that. It, it's raising awareness that there's not only Hamas in Gaza, but there's actually people, there are victims. As there are victims in Israel, as there are victims, meaning the hostages in Gaza, which also need to be taken care of and we, which need to, who, who need to be released unconditionally immediately. So we need to think about the victims, the children, the mothers, the fathers, anybody uh, who is not involved in this but is now involved without their own doing so. Um, so that awareness is important. And as you saw the conferences in Paris by President Macron, you see the, the recent statements by uh, Secretary Blinken or, or President Biden and many other statements around the world, the awareness that there are people behind this, this uh, border wall in Gaza um, and not just only Hamas terrorists, that is important. Uh, and everything has to be done to lighten the plight of the people, starting with letting fresh water and letting electricity in and so on and so forth, to supply the people, to help the people and to avoid as many casualties as, as possible. Ideally, with a ceasefire or a humanitarian ceasefire at least, um, that would be the demand. And we can only raise that over and over again. Thank you very much. I am Evi Chiori, and this was your Active's Beyond the Byline podcast. Visit your Active to stay on top of the latest news, sign up to our podcast newsletter, and if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, you can do so on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. Thank you for tuning in, and until next week. This episode produced by Your Active is part of the Trust Project.